you saw the very best players the entire country has to offer, and you saw it throughout the course of the weekend. He's growing, he's improving at such a rapid rate, he, he's going to be a very good player. This guy's a cross between Sean Marion and Lamar Odom. He's a six foot eight lefty, a high level athlete, but also got a little bit of point forward skills in him as he can handle and pass the ball extremely well. At this point, they are simply the standard by which everyone else is judged in prep school basketball. He's considering the likes of Michigan, North Carolina, Kentucky, Kansas. Welcome back to this latest episode of the Upside Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Finkelstein, and today we are continuing to dive into issues of social justice and racial inequality uh, in this country. And uh, an early disclaimer, I am not going to stick to sports in, in this episode. In fact, this isn't directly going to have much to do with sports at all. But before you click this off, uh, I ask that you bear with me um, because one of my major contentions in the last few weeks is that part of the disconnect we see in this, this country is a, is a lack of education. Um, stories that aren't told that, that impacts our perceptions, our beliefs, and those of our children. Um, and in recent weeks, one of the stories that has finally been starting to get told more and more is the story of the Tulsa race massacre. It's been featured on 60 Minutes, CBS Sunday Morning. Well, today we have with us Phil Armstrong, who is the project direct director of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission who will help educate all of us. And again, this isn't specific to basketball. We're not, I don't, I don't know if Phil even likes basketball. So, <laughs> but what, what it does, but it's relevant as, I, as I've said before, uh, it's relevant to basketball because it's relevant to our country. And these are history lessons that, that we all need to learn. And I myself am a big fan of history. And, and this is a piece of history that I was never taught. In fact, um, Phil, I have to tell you, the first time I heard of this, and this is something that I've written about in the last couple of weeks, was a, a friend of mine, a um, black friend of mine. We were having a conversation about race, and he said to me, have you ever heard of Black Wall Street? And I said, no. And he said, you've, you've got to check that out. So uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Well, uh, Adam, thank you so much. It's an honor. Uh, anytime we get an opportunity to, uh, in a sense, spread the message, um, and more so educate citizens. That's the, the work that we're doing, is just educating people. Uh, one, of the, um, one of my themes, if you will, personal themes uh, with this work, uh, I hold on to a lot of different poems, a lot of quotes. One is from uh, the African-American poet uh, laureate uh, James Baldwin, and he wrote, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So mm -hmm. Tulsa, uh, and this work of the commission is just taking a moment to say, hey, this happened. Uh, let's look at it. Let's delve into it. Let's face it together. But more importantly, let's see what we can learn from it and see how we can unify and reconcile and, and maybe even be a, a moment of healing and, and racial healing. And I think you can agree that right now in our nation, we're needing a lot of that. No, without without question. And, and to that point, uh, you know, it was we're recording this on a, on a Tuesday night. It was it was three weeks ago to the day that I myself woke up. I was kind of off the grid social media for, for that weekend, woke up and, and saw news of, of George Floyd in, in Minneapolis, but also uh, also what happened in New York. And, and of course, since then, there have been other issues that was almost 99 years to the day after the, the Tulsa race massacre. And so yeah. if you could, sir, set, set that backdrop for us of, of what it looked like in Tulsa and specifically in Greenwood uh, yeah. almost 99 years ago. So imagine um, and the, the geographic area um, was 33 to 35 city blocks. I want you to allow that uh, and your viewers today kind of let that sink in, sink in. A lot of people don't realize the, the sheer size of what Greenwood was at that time, 33 to 35 city blocks um, of African-American home ownership and business ownership. It was, it's not that it's the only community that was a prosperous African-American community because uh, one of the consequences or one of the side effects, if I can use that word, of Jim Crow laws that were, of course, designed to set African-Americans uh, in a certain caste in society, what it 
made black citizens do is depend on themselves. It, it, it caused them to be resilient among themselves and spend their money in their own community and depend on each other. So it, it uh, forced them to be that way. And, and it's just that in Tulsa, because of land ownership, because of the oil and gas boom uh, in industry in the early 1900s, African-Americans, uh, there was no other place in the United States that had this large concentration of uh, African-American wealth in a geog in one geographic area than Tulsa. And uh, so when we talk about Black Wall Street and Greenwood, we teach everyone uh, as much as we can that Black Wall Street today, it's not a geographic location. It's more so a mindset, that mindset of resilience. It's a story of resilience. Uh, Greenwood, uh, the section of the north area of Tulsa, if you are uh, an African-American and if you study African-American history, you know that in the United States, in many South Southern communities, when you cross the railroad tracks, especially in the South, you were in the black, the quote unquote black side of town. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, many communities were uh, of that way throughout the United States and Tulsa was no different. The Frisco railroad tracks, it runs parallel east and west of the city of the downtown Tulsa. So it butts, uh, butts up against the downtown area of Tulsa. And so right across the Frisco Rail Railroad tracks to the north was this place called Greenwood. And um, in the late 1800s, African-Americans came here by one of two things, uh, through the Trail of Tears, the five civilized tribes of, uh, of uh, Native Americans when uh, the 1830s, when they signed the Indian Removal Act uh, with the U.S. government to relocate the five civilized tribes to the Oklahoma and Arkansas territory. Uh, many of those tribes had African slaves. Uh, and a lot of times people will sit back and say, I didn't know Native Americans owned slaves. Yes, by the hundreds of thousands um, wow. uh, in, in the deep south, Native Americans owned slaves. Um, and they brought their slaves with them on that journey, on that trail of tears. Mm -hmm. um, that journey started in the latter fall of, of 1830 and then went into the, 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 the harsh winter months. And that's why so many Native Americans lost their lives. Many African Americans lost their lives. But those that made it to Oklahoma, um, they had the allotment, the disbursement, the disbursement of land among the five civilized tribes. And uh, those who had intermingled, blood intermingled, that's why they're called the freedmen, those mm. that could tie their direct relation to Native Americans through the Creek, through the Choctaw, through Cherokee, um, um, those that could tie in their blood direct relationship. When the allotment of land was given, they received their fair share. And um, 1865, when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, and it was a year after that. In fact, this past Sunday, June the 14th, uh, is, um, was the 1866, June 14th, is when the Creek Nation released or gave freedom to their African slaves, and they gave them allotments of their land to them. And so wow. all over Oklahoma, you had all these pockets of African Americans who immediately overnight because of their direct lineage, became landowners. And when you own land, you had wealth. And so there were over 50 all black historic towns in Oklahoma um, all throughout, the, throughout, the, throughout the whole state. In fact, uh, there were so many African-American towns, all black towns as they were referred to, and Native Americans in Oklahoma that in the mid 1880s, Oklahoma, uh, was actually kind of being discussed as possibly being an all black state. And this is, of course, before the land rush of 1889. But um, this, again, history that people just aren't aware of. Um, and then the second thing that led to that is as these towns prospered and grew, um, there were black news. Almost every town had its own black newspaper and they participated in what was called black boosterism. They literally mm -hmm. sent pamphlets and newspaper articles around the country, especially in the South. And in summary, telling African-Americans, escape the harsh realities of, of slavery, uh, uh, escape the poverty, how hard it is to make it after 1865 and making your way. Make your way to Oklahoma. 
We own mm -hmm. land. We have business here. We can seek a life of our own here. We're doing well. Come to Oklahoma. And so hundreds of thousands of African-Americans made the difficult journey and got to Oklahoma and found this mecca of towns all owned and all operated under black people. And so, you know, fast forward, move up to 1906. Mm -hmm. O.W. Gurley. He's the first African-American that is credited being that he's called the father of Black Wall Street. He's the first to purchase 40 acres of land in this area of Greenwood. And he opened. Uh, do you mind me? Do you mind me asking, Please interrupting with a quick question? Where did, where did his wealth come from? So uh, he was the son of uh, former slaves. His mother and father ended up um, uh, making their way to Arkansas. They owned about 10, 200 acres of land that they farmed in Arkansas. Um, they both died and he sold that land and moved mm -hmm. to Tulsa, Oklahoma. So he that's where, he, again, land ownership. You had wealth. Yeah. Uh, if you owned land, he moved to uh, came to Tulsa. And the story goes that he got off of the train depot downtown Tulsa and there was no hotel, no official place for African-Americans to stay. In that day and age, you stayed with people who you knew. You stayed in their homes. Um, and so he was the first to create quite a, like the first boarding house, if you will, a, 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 the beginnings of a hotel. Uh, and that was the first business. And that's what started the economic. When he bought 40 acres of land, he bought that land and it had a designation that it could only be sold to other African-Americans so that they can either uh, build homes or they can open up businesses. So that's what started it. That's what got it going. And that domino effect just kept going. Uh, in and that designation was made by, by the buyer himself or was that, is, yes. is that a legislative thing? That was a designation he made as owner of this land. He would hmm. only, and it could only be sold to African-Americans. And so uh, again, it, it, that one person took the initiative and from there, you know, you have so many that, that, as he sold business or sold land to, they would create a business, they would make money, they reinvest that money, open another business, they would lend to others, they would uh, uh, help others open businesses. And it was just a domino effect. And so, you know, early 1900s, the oil boom hits, all these African Americans that own land out in these areas of Oklahoma. You know, they're they're millionaires overnight because you know the oil mm. and gas companies are writing royalty checks and, and wanting to buy mm. their oil rights. And so African Americans would come to this place called Greenwood to spend their money. Uh, these mm. were very, very wealthy, um, wealthy individuals. Many much of their wealth actually uh, was superior than to, to many of the whites uh, in, in and there lies the root of the problem, I'm sure. There you go. There you yeah. go. And that's where the, the animosity came from. And, and now to put it in perspective and, and, and uh, this, correct me if I'm wrong, and that goes for anything I'm going to say throughout the course of this interview. But according to what I've read, um, this, this area of Greenwood, which, which Booker T. Washington uh, first named, and I quote, Negro Wall Street, which was that's later correct. kind of re, renamed uh, Black Wall Street. But it, yeah. it included shops, restaurants, multiple newspapers, this grand hotel, a hospital of its own, a theater of its own. Um, I, I, I read that there was even a, a charter plane company. Um, yes. So, so, I mean, it was, it was flourishing. And to put it, to put it in perspective, um, owning land was, was rare for, for people of color in this country at that time. Correct. Um, Correct. So if, so, so talk to us about, you know, the, the scope of, of how much it flourished and then, and then perhaps go into how, how maybe that discrepancy with the other side of the tracks, the white part of the, the city, so to speak, led to the escalation of, of racial tensions. Yeah. So uh, as you uh, correctly stated, you know, it was Booker T. Washington called this that he called it Negro Wall Street because of the massive amount of wealth that was here and the businesses that were just generating and literally booming overnight. Um, I, I use this kind of analogy when I when I talk to high school students to give them a perspective of how that money was able to, to re regenerate in this community. They couldn't spend money anywhere else. 
So uh, a popular grocery store chain here in Oklahoma is called Reese's Grocery Store and one of the busiest ones here in Tulsa. And so I'll tell when I go to elementary schools or high schools, I'll say, now imagine if Governor Stitt today made it a law that you can only buy your milk and eggs at the Reese's Grocery Store at 15th and Lewis. Um, and I said, and, and, and then I'll say, and it's illegal for any grocery store in the state of, Ohio, of Oklahoma to sell milk and eggs. The only place you can do it is 15th and Lewis Research. And I'd say, do you imagine, can you imagine how the lines would be wrapped around that building? Because it's the only place you could buy and how rich they would get. And I mm. said, that's the perspective. These people had wealth and the only place they could spend their money and enjoy that wealth was in this area called Greenwood. So it was just, I think the, the, some of the economists have kind of estimated that the African-American dollar respin itself eight times in the in this economy wow. over and over and over and over again so wealth was the, the wealth here is just you, you cannot understate the amount of wealth that was here and 1200 black owned homes at its peak over 200 businesses there were actually three hospitals there were seven grocery stores uh the the, the williams theater the 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 uh, the uh uh, bars and the restaurants and the mom and pop shops and they all lined Greenwood Avenue. Greenwood Avenue is uh, where the you can call it Black Main Street, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. So it was just and and people were living. The African Americans were living quite well, and and so that leads to as we've already touched on the animosity because you lead up into the 1918, 1919, 1920s, and when soldiers returned from World War One, you know the economy was was really bad, and so you have white citizens who are looking across the railroad tracks, and if you have this mindset of superiority yeah. that no matter how low in life you are economically, you're still not black. I'm still a white man. And at that mindset, if you look across the railroad tracks and you see people who you feel that are inferior to you driving cars, dressing up in suits and mink coats and living in beautiful two story brick homes and you can barely keep yourself fed. It stirred up this animosity like you could not imagine. In fact, around the country. Um, in 1919, they called it, uh, there was an incident, incident, several incidents called the Red Summer of 1919, where several black communities around the country, there was just white mob uprisings that would just go into black communities and just out of sheer anger and jealousy, just destroy them. And mm -hmm. uh, it was all over the United States, Washington, D.C., Houston, uh, in New York, Elaine, Arkansas, and the list goes on and on all from around the winter of 1919 through the summer. And it, was, and it was named Red Summer of 1919 because of all the blood that was spilled in specifically white citizens, Ku Klux Klan type of mm. individuals that would just go into these black communities and destroy them out of, of mm. their anger. So that was 1919. So all that's going around the country, but yet you still have Greenwood that is just prospering. And still flourishing, oh, yeah. even as the rest of the country is struggling. Yeah. Even as the rest of the country is struggling. And so, you know, to, to move up to 1921, um, as we were talking before, Tulsa at that moment was like a tinderbox. Mm -hmm. Just it, all it needed was a strike of a match. Mm -hmm. There's this prime commercial property. The mayor and the, the city leaders at that time were trying to work with the Frisco Railroad tracks to try to figure out how they could buy this land, how they could get sure. the black citizens to move north and, and, and give up this land. Yep. And all they needed was an opportunity. And that mm -hmm. opportunity was the incident between uh, a 19 year old black boy named Dick Rowland, a 17 year old white girl named Sarah Page and the Drexler building May 30th and an incident that is now infamous, uh, yeah. and um, and which basically was the start or the the cause of what led to the to the massacre. So here's here's my question about that because in reading about this, what I couldn't find clearly stated was that incident in Greenwood or was it in another part of of Tulsa? Good question. It actually was in downtown Tulsa. Uh, of course, okay. highly segregated. Black citizens couldn't go go downtown Tulsa. Right. But if you were a domestic worker. Uh, or uh, if you worked for, for example, Dick Rowland, he had actually, uh, uh, I, I, I tease some of the students uh, when I go into high schools, he dropped out of Booker T. Washington High School to be a full-time shine boy. So uh, he, he must have made some really good money to- uh, so That's to, why to he was there. That. But he was a shine boy and there was only one facility 
or one building that would accommodate, uh, uh, back then they called it a colored restroom for, for, for black citizens. And that was in on the thir third floor of the Drexler building. The Drexler building still stands in Tulsa today. It's still there. And the third wow. floor of all of Tulsa, there was only one place that African-Americans could go use the restroom. And so he went to the Drexler building to relieve himself. And the way the story, the way it's written up is that something happened on the elevator, either the floor that didn't rest correctly on the floor or, or but he lost as he's getting on the elevator, he lost his step uh, to cheat from falling on the ground. He reaches out and grabs um, Sarah Page's arm she screams, mm -hmm. it's broad daylight. Um, the door opens up, he takes off running. Mm -hmm. um, the merchant across the street, the white merchant came, comes to, to, the, to, the, to the elevator, asks her, you know, are you okay? Uh, what happened? By that afternoon, the Tulsa Tribune, which many credit for being what caused the massacre. Uh, many newspapers back then practiced in what they called yellow journalism. I was Yellow say, the headline began with "Nag ne Negro," I believe, yeah. something like that. That's, That's it. Yeah. The salaciousness of the article is what's caused it. So imagine you're a, you're a white gentleman. You 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 have this tendency to think in in probably a member of the Ku Klux Klan. You look on the front page paper and it says "Nab Negro for attacking white girl on elevator." Now imagine what that's going to do to the citizens. All again, all they needed was something to say, enough is enough. These black citizens think they're better than us. And now basically the, the, the context is one of them is going to try to rape, rape one of our innocent right. white young ladies in broad daylight. We've had enough, you know, so he gets arrested um, the next day, May 31st. He's at he's at the courthouse uh, in jail. Uh, a mob forms uh, white citizens. The number is about a thousand white mm -hmm. citizens come to, to to basically take him out to jail and lynch him. And they're, and they're just to be just to because I think that's a key point. They're literally going to pull him out of the jail and, exactly. and, and lynch him. Exactly. And when, yeah. if someone says, well, how do how do you, you know, how did you know that was going to happen? So ironically, the year before in 19, the summer of 1920, a white young white boy by the name of Roy Belton, he robbed a taxi cab driver, another fellow white citizen. And in robbing him, he killed him. He killed the taxi cab driver robbing him and was arrested. The white citizens got together, pulled him out of jail and lynched him in the court in downtown Tulsa. And that happened in the summer of 1920. So the the A.J. Smitherman, who was the black uh, editor of the Tulsa Star, would was a, would write articles and, and write newspaper articles. But what he wrote of this basically in summary saying we need to stick together. We need to be careful because if they'll do this to a white citizen, right. imagine what they'll do that to us. So when that happened in 1920. And there was lynchings going on all over the country. Again, for context, this was, for context, the arc of oppression is what we call it. This was yeah. a mainstay of, of the United States. In fact, in one of the most vicious lynchings took place in Okima, Oklahoma. In 1911, a mother and her son were lynched from a bridge, and there's a there's actually a, a big picture of it that's in the history books uh, of a lynching of Laura Nelson and her son in Okima. So black citizens were very aware of this white animosity towards them, and so you know, getting back to the the Dick Rowland being in jail, the word gets out that there's a lynch mob that's being formed that's at the courthouse, and black citizens, black men who had served in the war. Okay. Discipline had their own, I guess, exercising their Second Amendment rights. They got their 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 munitions and they decided to go down and to protect. They wanted to see him have his day in court, get taken mm -hmm. you know, through his, his due process. And so they went march down not to kill anyone. They went down just to stand guard and help. They literally wanted to help the sheriff protect the life of Dick Rowland um, around Was 10 mob armed as well. The mob at that time were not armed. There okay. was just torches and bring him out. We want to, you know, we want to take yeah. care of this our own way. Okay. Uh, and uh, the black they citizens. Were, they were severely outnumbered, though. They were. So the black citizens, the black men that marched down, it's, it's estimated that there were about three dozen mm -hmm. compared to a thousand, mm -hmm. the number yeah. of, a thousand of, of the lynch mob. Sure. And so the, of course, by around 10 o'clock, uh, it, it stated that. A argument broke out between uh, a white gentleman who went up to one of the so black soldiers to try to disarm him. 
And in that tussle, in that trying to disarm him around 1030, uh, the sh the first that that gun discharged, and when mm -hmm. that gun discharged, quote the paper said, quote all hell broke loose, and that was downtown Tulsa. Uh, the black citizens retreat back to Greenwood. The Tulsa Police Department at that time deputize the white mob, give them guns, give them ammunition, and uh, they proceed to march into Greenwood and um, completely destroy it. The the things that are most staggering to me and everything about an incident like this is, is just pure evil. But the things that really stick out to me when I read about it and, and is that, um, I mean, you can talk about the, the fact that they, they didn't even identify everyone who was, who was shot and killed, but, and then you go, and I may be jumping steps here, but not one person from that mob was charged. The, exactly. I was told that there were, officers, right? I shouldn't say I was told. I read that there were officers who were marching with that mob, that the mob prevented the fire department from coming Correct. in to put out the fires. And then after it was over, and I know I'm stepping here, but there was no insurance money that was, that was, uh, that was awarded for lack of a better word. Um, and so when you talk about the word systematic, um, that, that's, that's one thing to me. And again, this, this isn't even a hundred years ago. Um, Correct. and so I, I didn't want to, I mean, I, I certainly don't want to tell the story because, uh, you're the expert, but I think those are things that in my research just mm -hmm. immediately struck me about how could that even be possible? One of the first controversial things that the commission did was to accept that the community, uh, the black community at large wanted to be able to take over the narrative. Mm -hmm. The narrative has been that this was a race riot. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, one of the first things that they did with intentionality held a press conference and said, this is no longer to be referred to as the Tulsa race riot. It's going to be called what it was, a massacre. Mm -hmm. And they call it a Tulsa race massacre. Of course, there was pushback. Many said, you know, you're just rewriting history. You know, why are you messing with things like that? You know, you're, you're, you're trying to twist the truth. So we use this as an education to say, OK, if you understand the power struggle, the power uh, th that was taking place and that was the white citizens, the majority of those that were in power were members of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, the mayor, the city council, the police, the leaders, the Frisco Railway, they wanted this land. Um, when the Tulsa Tribune labeled this a riot, when they called it a riot, what that did, uh, as I tell students, this is the importance of making sure that when you name something, the power in naming something, when they named it a riot, None of these citizens who paid their home insurance, who paid their business insurance because insurance companies would not pay out for a riot. Mm -hmm. None of them, none of them got their, their claim. Oh, not, I see. not a one, not, not one person. People are like, are you serious? Not one person to this day uh, has ever, not one family, not one business owner, not one person that even and died none of them were able to get a uh, claim and, and, and they filed their claims, but none right. of them would be honored. In because fact, riots weren't, weren't under the, the policy. Exactly. exactly. Wow. And, and so there were, there were actually white citizens as well. I, I, I try to teach students, not every white person in, in, in Tulsa was were out killing black people. I mean, you're talking about yeah. 1500 out of a, about a population of 20,000. Mm -hmm. There were many white citizens that went to find, to try to help, to try to, to shield, to try to feed those of the days after. We had many churches on their records that show where they went and found citizens, black citizens, hid them in their basements to, to feed them um, and, and take care of them. But for those that experienced that trauma, experienced that that terrible tragedy, to not be able to, to, to file insurance. And when we changed the name, the community said, listen, there's there's a number of names that you could use to describe this. You could have called it a, a you could have called it a Holocaust. You could have called it a disaster. You could have called it a pogrom. Um, but a riot. I mean, it, it's so eerily representing of what we're dealing with today. A riot is when citizens rise up in their own community and do damage and destruction in their own community. The Greenwood citizens didn't destroy their community. Um, an entire 
community, another community invaded their community right. and destroyed their community. Why would you call that? How could you call that a riot? It was a massacre. And so that's the meaning behind that. And when you explain that, people then say, you know, never thought about it like that. Now that you put it that way, I totally get it. Yeah, I'd it's probably, hard to. I probably want to change the name too. So. Hard to disagree with that logic. And again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but other things that I read say, talk about the massacre itself. And I watched the, the, the names eluding me at the moment, but I, I watched the uh, HBO series that's that's linked on your site. Yes. And it's such a movie. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you, it, you know, it's such an emotional few minutes just to watch. And, and yes. you know, e even though it's a, it's a, um, you know, it, it's not, I want to make sure I word this correctly, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a historical fiction maybe is the best mm -hmm. way to say it. It's not based on, on real characters, but the, the, I mean, it's based on real events, but the characters weren't, weren't uh, actual uh, documented mm -hmm. people. But the, I mean, a massacre to me, how could it be anything else? Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got guys uh, an elevated position with machine guns, just, just yes. cl clearing the field you had. And this was another thing that I just, I just said, Oh my God, you had, uh, ammunition coming down from planes. Is that correct? Yes. So people that is absolutely correct. Uh, because the, 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 the reason it took so long is because black citizens were fighting back. Sure. Uh, they, there were, se there are, there are several reports to the Oklahoma historical society has the reports. There were several pockets of where black citizens were resisting and killing, uh, defending themselves and, and killing black white citizens that were trying to take control. In fact, uh, there is a place here called Standpipe Hill in which you're referring to, and black citizens actually had the advantage. They were elevated in position and mm. at some point they were shooting to defend their homes. Uh, but that is a site of a, of, a, of, a, of a big battle. White citizens took over and then they placed uh, I guess what we refer to as, as Gatling gun, machine guns, and firing down into the, the, the areas. But what really did the, 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 the most severe damage that really wiped out the, 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 all this, this section of the city is private uh, uh, individuals, white citizens who had planes. And this is all in the Oklahoma Historical Society. They have actual accounts and eyewitness accounts where planes were flying over and they were dropping incendiary devices and bomb-like uh, devices, dropping them on the buildings, on the homes. And that's what did the damage because, you know, they're landing on the roof of these buildings and then they're burning from the roof down to the ground. And when you look at the devastation, I mean, it just looks, it looks like a bomb just dropped and just leveled this, the, this section of the city. And so when people saw that and that, and that first three minutes and 39 seconds, uh, HBO has been so, we've been communicating with them. Damon Lindelof, who's the executive uh, uh, producer and the uh, creator of that, uh, that's communicated with me and, and the support of what we're doing here. And uh, I told him, you know, it, it changed the trajectory of what we were trying to get out. It really made people, gave people a visual representation of what it must have been like to be yeah. in the midst of a riot of this nature. So it was, it was powerful. But the, 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 the weeks after that, the phone calls that came from all over the country, the BBC across the sea, the, the two questions were how much of that was real mm. and how much it was just Hollywood drama. And number two, if it was real, how come we've never heard about this? Exactly, yeah. And that's the whole key to it all is that this is what's been referred to as Tulsa's dirty little, little secret because it was kept hidden for so many years. And I, I read a story about a young man who, uh, this couldn't have been that long ago, who grew up in Greenwood, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, and learned about this in college, even though yes. he was never taught it in the local school system. Yes. And that to me is, you know, when, when people talk about, um, you know, our, our country's history and things, because again, to put this in perspective, we're talking about guys dropping bombs out of planes and shooting machine guns from the top of elevators. And then not one person was ever arrested or tried. Not correct. one insurance claim is paid. And then again, correct me if I'm wrong, but, and then I also read that city officials turned away contributions after this earmarked for the rebuilding of Greenwood. Um, correct. So it, it's, uh, and then, and then to just kind of sweep it under the rug and make sure it's, it's not taught. I mean, that's what yeah. people are talking about when they when they talk about systemic racism in education, is it not? Exactly. Exactly. And th so that points to and, we, and I, this is kind of the overarching theme that we talk about is the resilience, the resilience mm -hmm. of these people to say, because 
Um, you know, about f there were 10 to 12,000 African Americans that lived in Greenwood prior to 1921. After the massacre, about 4,000, 4 to 6,000 fled and left, never returned. But those that remained rebuild, rebuilt. Um, in the weeks afterwards, the city, again, they wanted this land. The city made an ordinance that black citizens could, it was illegal. <laughs> if, if you can't believe this, it's actually documented city ordinance where they could not rebuild their homes and businesses. Mm. Um, they did not want them to have the opportunity to rebuild this wonderful place. Um, and so the father of John Hope Franklin, B.C. Franklin, he was an attorney. And in 1921, the first thing he did is tell black citizens, you know, whatever, if, if you had to put two pop crates together, you put something that represents where you're building your house. Mm. Um, and he filed legal documents to say that that legislation, that city ordinance was illegal. It went all the way to the state Supreme Court of Oklahoma and they um, awarded him and found in his favor that it was illegal to create this ordinance. And because of what he did and fought legally, that was the only reason that basically black citizens were given the opportunity to rebuild their homes. And so there was this 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 effort, this we've got to rebuild this as quickly as possible to keep them, keep anyone from coming in and taking our land, buying right. our land or getting the opportunity. And so, you know, within five years, unbelievable, within five years, 80 to 90 percent of uh, Greenwood was rebuilt, uh, uh, which is amazing. With, with, again, no insurance money. They pulled their money together and commuted them. The black towns around Oklahoma pulled their money together, supported them financially to rebuild this place within five years. And it flourished. It reached its peak in the 40s. And then yes. um, and then what is what is the extended history that perhaps isn't, yeah. isn't even as well known, even if you did watch 60 Minutes or, or CBS exactly. Sunday morning? Yeah, that was that was the part that 60 Minutes did a wonderful job. I mean, it was so excellently produced. They spent some time here. Uh, it's everyone kind of gets to 1921 and stops as if mm -hmm. time stood there then, then. No one tells the story of how it rebuilt. But then people say, well, if it was rebuilt, it was so wonderful. What happened? So there are three major things. And I'll do those quickly. Number one, uh, the impact of integration. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm an integrationist, of course. You know, I went to uh, public schools with, with white students and, and black students. But imagine when integration uh, hit, you know, Jim Crow laws are done away with. The mm -hmm. empowerment that it gave black citizens that my grandfather, my father, my mother could not shop and buy anything mm. downtown. Can you imagine how sure. empowering it was to go downtown and be the first black person to buy whatever it is on that wall or that 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 item or that garment? And you have to it's by law. You have to sell this to me now. And so I'm buying this, put my money down. And I'm going to come back tomorrow and buy something else. I mean, right. I, you, you have to imagine how empowering that was. The consequence is it took money out of the black community. So the downward spiral of black citizens could now spend their money wherever they want it. It caused that renumeration of, of that black dollar started going away and it started mm -hmm. eroding. The second thing uh, would be uh, African-Americans who in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, where their parents said, go to college, become the first black to go be the first one to go to college, be be successful, be a doctor, a lawyer. Um, make something of yourself, make us proud. They did that. They left Oklahoma, they became successful and they never came back. Uh, and so these mom and pop shops did not have anyone to pass their business down to. So when they died, their business died with them. And then the third, the death nail really that, that tore up, that really made Greenwood uh, pretty much die uh, to an extent of what of its formal life um, was when the uh, many African Americans experienced this in the 60s and the 70s. The urban renewal programs, where they built these highway systems, I-244 in Tulsa goes right through the heart of Greenwood. That happened to every black community in the city. I mean, in in the country, you can go to Detroit, you can go to St. Louis, you can go to every major city where there is a black community. You can see that the highway goes through some part of that black community, um, and it went right through the heart of Greenwood. Uh, the displacement through eminent domain of black homes and black businesses. And so people say, you know, well, how does that happen? Again, I use this as an educational tool to, 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 to young students and high school students. That's the importance of having diverse voices sitting around the table. 
Because mm. in the 60s and 70s, when it's just a table of white men and nothing against white men today, of course. But at that time, the power that conserve, that white men had to say, hey, a highway system's going through. It's not going through my neighborhood. Send it through the black neighborhood. And no yeah. one, no constituent was to stand up and no one to say, you're not going to put that through my neighborhood. You know, those are where my people live, the people that I represent. Every community in the United States experienced that. It went through the path of least resistance. There was no one to say, no, don't do this. And so this repeated itself many, many times over in the United States. But again, it's another example of, of evidence. Reasons. And to me, that's why this, this story is, is such a microcosm because you have this horrific act that, that more and more people are starting to, to find out about, but that was covered up for a long time. And yes, in the wake of that act, you can see the systemic racism in our education system, yes. in in the in the uh, legislature, um, and, and so it's 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 a microcosm. I I know we are running short on time, but the one thing I wanted to ask you about before uh, we go, politics being so polarizing in today's day and age, the one thing I noticed um, was bipartisan support for your current projects yes. in an in initiative. So I, I wondered if you could touch upon that. I, I, I don't yes. I, I don't have anything behind that question. I, it was just something that immediately uh, stuck out to me, especially, I mean, you know, with with all that's going on in the world today, with there supposed to be a rally in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it, it struck me that, that this has bipartisan support. And so I, I would uh, I was curious to ask you about that. So when you go to our website, uh, one of the, the, the videos that we're, we're most proud of uh, on uh, Tulsa2021.org, you'll see a video of, and I use this language with intentionality. You have a black Democrat, Democrat State Senator mm -hmm. Kevin Matthews. Mm -hmm. You have a white Republican, U.S. Senator James Lankford, mm -hmm. um, put their ideological differences aside in 2015, and they come together and say, this story needs to be told. Mm -hmm. We need to coalesce around this and we need to do something of a significant nature that allows us to reflect, commemorate, educate people on it and unify around it and be a place of racial healing and, and, and reconciliation. So this is a bipartisan commission. We have people who are Republican, who are Democrat. We have religious, non-religious. We have every representation of the community of Tulsa on this commission and it's 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 a testament honestly to where people are and that timing is everything yes it's 99 years and 100 years is coming that helps push people to say oh, we we really got to do something for the 100th year but it helps drive that that conversation forward that you know this is not a black story this is an american story this happened on american soil and we no longer are going to sit back and be a part of those people that say oh we don't want to talk about that no right. We're going to talk about it. We're going to deal with it because it's going to help us in healing racial tensions now. Um, and so with, with things that are happening now, it is actually just casting more of a big light on the commission and our work and our aims for reconciliation and, and racial unity in the United States. Mr. Armstrong, I know you you uh, you do have to go. Is there anything I didn't ask? Anything that we are any anything that we are missing? Uh, just that uh, in 2021 will be the centennial. We are planning to have uh, a week long of commemorative events. Uh, the main thing will be the building of an 11,000 square foot facility called Greenwood Rising that will be under construction now. And it will be a museum, a museum uh, grade world class facility where the information I talked about now, people will actually be able to go through a narrative museum experience right here in Greenwood to hear and see this, this history. Greenwood Rising in 2021. Well, thank you very much, sir. We wish you all the luck with that. It is, uh, as I said, a story that, that people need to know, not not just because it, it's it's a chapter of our American history, but because it, it is a microcosm. It, it, yes. it gives you tangible history of the systemic racism um, that, 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 can, that can come uh, and that has come in this country, but also uh, because of some of the healing that's going on in the bipartisan efforts and the hope that that can offer in, in these uh, these polarizing times. So thank you very much, sir, for, for joining us today and, and, and for all your work. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much.